excited to get a chance to talk to you. If the, uh, the slide template doesn't make it clear, I work for Anaconda. Um, I've been working on Numba for a long time. Uh, I want to call it Su Kwan Lam in the audience. He is the lead developer. Um, in the spirit of this session, I'm going to attempt to give this talk in 20% less time than it needs. So bear with me if I go a little fast. Uh, so you're here. You've probably heard Numba way more times than you wanted to during this talk. Ironically, I'm not going to actually talk about GPUs, although Numba does GPU uh, stuff. We're just going to talk about optimization in general. And since we like processes, I'm going to give you a four-step process for how to use Numba in your program. Uh, first, make an honest self-inventory. Uh, why do you want to speed up your code? Uh, this, uh, this may sound a little bit pedantic, but we find that when we're trying to help people, it often starts to start really first principles. Are you tired of waiting for your jobs to finish? Are you trying to scale up to larger workloads? Uh, are you doing it for entertainment or drag racing purposes? Be honest with yourself. It's OK. <laughs> um, and, and the second thing is, once you understand why you're trying to make your code go faster, uh, it's good, I find, to express your ultimate goal in absolute terms, not relative terms. Uh, and this is to keep you focused on the goal. If your goal is to you know, have jobs finish faster, you might want to phrase this in, this job, I wish it took less than 20 minutes. Uh, less of, I wish this job rent went 50% faster, or even worse, I want to reach 90% of the theoretical hardware maximum. Uh, now, that might be your goal if you're in that last category. And you do want to keep in mind, I don't, I don't want to call Juan here, but because <laughs> I was thinking, oh, wait, I'm going to talk about this. Uh, but I, the reason I do want to point that out is, is you should be aware of maybe some of those things to know if what you're demanding is feasible. Uh, if your goal is to take your 17-hour you know, job and run it in 35 seconds, that might not be realistic. Um, but uh, you do want to make sure that you don't go down a rabbit hole of just making things faster to make things faster because you will make yourself crazy and be uh, disappointed with yourself. So, uh, you know, be realistic and, and figure out what you want. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is, uh, uh, okay, you know, Maslow maybe wasn't a programmer. Maslow's hierarchy of software project needs. Uh, where are you on this pyramid? Um, obviously, the base layer is, does this program run? If your program doesn't run, don't worry about making it faster. Um, are there automated tests? Uh, I, I don't have to get all crazy about unit testing. I'll say a little bit about that later. But if you have no way to check if your program still works, uh, it might work one day. And then if you go do a bunch of optimization, how do you know if it's still working? Third thing, is there user documentation? Uh, it may be a better use of your time to make your program easier to understand how to use than to try and make it faster, unless the performance is at the level where it actually violates the first thing and the program doesn't work because it takes two years to run. Uh, third thing, is it easy to install? And if you can check off all of these boxes reasonably, not perfectly, but you know, you feel good about it, then ask yourself the question, is it fast enough? So to, to help, um, since we kind of you know, get in our own little world sometimes, uh, to help focus this talk, I went and picked a uh, project that I saw on the agenda for SciPy 2019, uh, Pi MCMC stat, and set myself to the task of trying to figure out how to speed it up a little bit. Um, there's not going to be a big finale here or anything, but it was uh, in looking at sort of how to speed that up, it helped to focus on the kinds of things you might run into on a code base I had never seen before. I have no connection with this project, um, so anything I've done here wrong is, uh, is my fault, obviously, not theirs. Um, I wanted an unfamiliar project uh, that I could uh, look at that came with good docs uh, and had good examples that I could look at. So I would highly encourage you to go check out their talk uh, at 310, totally unsolicited. Um, I, ironically, as I was trying to go through some of the other projects to find ones, I kept finding projects that used number I didn't know about. Uh, so <laughs> it was actually hard to find one. Um, that was both amenable to it and also wasn't already using it. So let's talk a little bit about how Numba works. You may have already seen this in some previous talks. Uh, Numba is a just-in-time function compiler. There are lots of ways you can approach compiling Python. The approach Numba takes is to compile individual functions or collections of functions just in time as you need them because what we're looking to do is go down this pipeline of taking the bytecode of your function and also looking at the types of the arguments you pass to us. Compilation is these two things. It's what does your code do and what data types are you operating on? Uh, that's how we need to make fast code. Once we know those two things, we can go down this analysis pipeline of figuring out, okay, if this is what you passed in, these are the types of everything else in the function. 
uh, we can then start generating uh, some sort of intermediate representation of what you're doing, filling in all the data types and all that other stuff, and then get down to the back end of uh, LLVM. LLVM is a uh, very popular uh, compiler library. So the reason Numba exists is because we didn't have to write the back end of the compiler. So all of the details about optimizing low-level code and generating machine code for you know, 5, 6, 20, whatever different CPUs, that's all handled in the LLVM library that's used by compilers like Clang and other things. Uh, once we can take our, generate, our translation of your Python code down to LLVM IR and then run it through the LLVM backend, we now have machine code which we can cache and also execute. And the cache is important so that the next time you run around through this loop in the program, we can just jump straight to the end and not have to go through all the analysis steps. So <laughs> it helps to understand a little bit about the number internals. Um, one of the things that uh, people sometimes get uh, kind of confused about or, or have a hard time wrapping their head around is that Numba, because Numba doesn't reach out and change the interpreter or anything, we can't go out into other places in your program and change how you store the data. We can't go say, oh, that thing that you put in a Python list, that actually would have been a NumPy array. Let's just do that for you. We can't do that because we have to take the data as you give it to us. Uh, so on the way into a compiled number function, we go through a process called unboxing, which is to basically take whatever you gave us and strip off the Python object bits. So in the case of an umpire array, this is very easy to do. An umpire array is a little bit of description about how the memory is laid out and a pointer. So unboxing is very fast. Um, more complicated data types, if we support them, might require doing things like right now the um, you know, current list support. If you pass us a list of integers, we actually have to walk down that whole list, take every one of those integer objects, pop them out, and put them into something that kind of looks like a C array. Uh, so that unboxing uh, has to happen every time you go into no Python mode. Um, we then you know, compile the bytecode as I was mentioning, and the other thing that Numba is doing is basically looking through the function and saying, okay, you're using this built-in, or you're using this NumPy function, or whatever, and we basically swap in an implementation that we've written for that built-in that we know how to translate down to fast machine code. Uh, that's what's actually happening is Numba is basically spotting all of these things and putting in an implementation that we can compile. And then we let LLVM do a lot of the hard compiler uh, heavy lifting, like inlining functions, auto-vectorizing loops, uh, other optimizations you'd expect from a C compiler. That's all happening with LLVM in the background. And then when you call the function, we actually can release the gil if you request it. So if you have threading happening outside of your uh, number function, um, you can release the gil on the way in the function, and then those two functions can run in parallel on, or that function can run in parallel on multiple threads. Uh, and then when we're done, if you return anything back out of your function, we have to rebox it back into Python land because we're going back into the interpreter again. So things to keep in mind is that some things that Numba does not do. Num Numba is not automatically translating NumPy's implementation into something that we can compile. We actually have to re-implement those operations. And we've had many external contributors help us uh, cover some of those things. Um, it's not automatically compiling any of the other third-party libraries. We're not looking into pandas or other things and just automatically compiling those for you. It also doesn't do partial compilation. And what I mean by this is that to compile a function, we have to be able to, at the time you call it, resolve all the data types. We have to be able to say, oh, I know exactly what's happening in here, every data type everywhere, um, which is usually fine. Uh, there are some more creative Python uh, programming styles that make that harder to do. Uh, and so <laughs> you may occasionally run into some frustration where the way that you write Python um, might be something that Numba can't figure out. Um, we also aren't changing the layout of the data. Uh, we're not translating the whole program. We're just translating the functions you tell us to. And, and we're not going to magically make a single, if, you're, if your bottleneck is a single NumPy function, we're unlikely to make that better except in some very unusual cases. Uh, not because NumPy is written in C. Um, so we're not, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no magic uh, here. And there are some cases where, uh, you know, Numba is just unlikely to help. Numba is not for everyone. Please consult with your doctor before <laughs> starting to use Numba. Um, there are situations where you want whole program compilations. So things like PyPy are fantastic. Um, some critical, if you, all of your critical functions have already been converted to C or optimized Cython, it's going to be hard to find a place where Numb is going to beat that. So if you've already done that work, don't, don't repeat it, unless you have another reason to want to do that. If you need to interface directly to C++, Numba does not have a good story for talking to C++ code currently unless you put it in a C wrapper first. Um, this is an area where Cython shines. 
Um, if you need to actually generate C, and one thing to note in that diagram is as we were going through doing all this compilation stuff, we never generate C code. We actually go straight from Python down to the lower layer of LLVM. There's no C in the middle. So that we're very different from Cython in that respect. Cython translates to C++, which you can then inspect if you so choose, and then compile uh, after the fact. There are pros and cons to that approach. Um, and if your algorithms are not uh, primarily numerical. Um, we're, our, our, our bread and butter is numerical code. Fortunately, it's fairly common in a place like SciPy. Um, but if you're doing uh, other complicated stuff, we have seen some people get some mileage out of Numba for bit manipulation. Uh, for example, the fast parquet library uses Numba to implement um, some parsing of parquet data that's worked pretty well for them. But if you're doing a lot of very, uh, I would say, sort of a bunch of like object entities talking to other objects, that sort of thing, very uh, object-oriented programming feeling stuff. Numba may not work so well, and maybe PyPy uh, is a better option for you. Okay, so we've, we've uh, you know, asked ourselves some tough questions. Uh, what's the next step? Next step is measurement. Don't go optimize anything until you have measured it first. Uh, and as most people in this room are familiar, measurement is hard. Uh, so be willing to spend a little time on this. It'll pay off later. The first thing to realize is that uh, your unit tests and performance tests are different things. Unit tests are answering the question of, did I break it? Does this code still do what I want? Do not optimize your code by just timing your unit test suite before and after you make a change. Uh, and, and some of you may be smirking because you've done that. I've tried that. Um, don't do that. You'll, you'll, I'll talk about why in a bit here. So, the unit testing side of things, uh, if you don't have a test suite, it's okay, you can admit it. Um, the best thing you can do right now is just go find one representative job that you feel like touches a lot of the program and make that what I would call a smoke test. If that falls over, you might not know exactly where in the program is broken, but at least you know it's broken. Um, take a run that you trust and make the output of that run the expected value for the test. Um, uh, the unit test purists are all screaming inside, but this is better than not having a test at all. So do this first. Uh, as you have time and, and, and resources, move into testing individual functions and doing a, a proper test suite. But if you want to start optimization and you have no testing, you're in for a bad time. So just at least have one. Um, one thing to note about unit testing, though, uh, scientific code especially, is you have to be realistic about expected accuracy. Uh, as I've mentioned many times, floating point numbers aren't real. They, they're not associative. Uh, if you add them up in a different order, they will give you slightly different answers because of rounding. Um, and so as a result here, this is just a quick thing I can do, is if I just add up a bunch of, you know, this is a... So 100 million numbers or something, uh, if I add them up in one order or if I reverse the array and add them up, I get a slightly different answer. And so if my unit test is testing if the you know, one way exactly equals the other way, uh, I'm gonna get false, this, this test failed. Um, there's nice, uh, I encourage you to take a look at the NumPy testing uh, submodule. There's all kinds of good stuff in there. Um, the all close method is a really great way to uh, tweak the tolerance and say, okay, this is still correct if it's within you know, 10 to the minus six or whatever, whatever threshold makes sense for your problem. All right, so let's talk about performance testing. As I mentioned, unit tests are not a performance test suite. Um, they tend to overemphasize sort of order one and order n kind of steps, like setup, teardown, IO, that sort of thing. Um, also, that you tend to write unit tests with small inputs because you want to understand the input and the output relation, um, which means that they won't exercise the part of your code that scales with the size of input typically. Um, so you really want your performance test to have a realistic complexity and input sizes. Um, and then if you, oftentimes your performance test will run long enough, you don't need to worry about this, but if they run super short for more accurate timing, things like the time it uh, magic function in Jupyter or the time module, um, I should have been the time it module, um, can help you do that. So once you have a performance test, you want to collect some information from it. Uh, in particular, it's really good to get familiar with profiling tools like cProfile, um, which comes with Python, which you can run on the command line or run in a notebook, depending on where your code is living. Um, it's very helpful to then dump that output. You often want to run the profile, save it, mark it as something, so you can always come back to it. As you make changes to your code, you want to be able to go back to the old profile, compare it to where you're at, just to see where you've gone. Um, once you have that uh, profile, you can look at it with either the built-in pstats module, which is a command line interface, which is pretty quick and dirty, but it can be hard to navigate through a fairly complicated thing. Um, so there's, I'll show you SnakeViz in a second, which is a, a very useful tool for visualizing uh, profiles. I will note, if you're new to this, 
it will take a little while for profiling to become intuitive for you. So uh, if you feel overwhelmed and get confused, you may have to spend some time just kind of poking around and thinking about things. Maybe even deliberately inserting in your code like some, some pointless waste time things and see how it impacts the profile, just to get some intu intuition. Uh, I don't have time to talk about line profiler. Line profiler is also fantastic, especially when you have a function that calls a bunch of NumPy calls, where it's not obvious which line in your function is actually the one taking up all the time but line profile is also great. So here I, I grabbed two examples out of the PI MCMC stat examples uh, and ran them through the profiler and then snake viz. And here I can immediately see uh, that there is, most of the time is being spent actually in this function called algae sys, which is actually a user provided function that goes into this uh, Monte Carlo Markov chain. Uh, system. So this is this is actually a really nice case because it means you, if all your time's on one function, you can go just focus on that function. Fortunately, there's so there's a different example here uh, where you see uh, sc time scattered around in a bunch of places, um, and this is this is maybe more typical for some kinds of situations where uh, different operations. I you know it's hard to pull this out here, but there are a bunch of different things going on in each of those. If you look at down the one, two, three, four, the fifth layer where you see like couple of major chunks down there. Those are just entirely different parts of the program. And so um, there's not gonna be sort of one, make this 100 times faster and then the whole program's 100 times faster. You may have to go kind of whack-a-mole a little bit with this. Um, it's good to focus on the biggest thing first. And this is why profiling is so important, is to make sure that you focus on the thing that has the biggest impact and not what you think has the biggest impact because one of the more uh, frustrating things about this is it's very hard to guess what's slow. You can develop some intuition over a while, but you'll, you'll often be surprised. Okay, so we've made some measurements so we know where our program is slow. Next we get to the step three, refactoring the code. Uh, so this is where you have to make a decision. If you're using Numbo, how you want to use Numbo. And there are a couple of different patterns that people have uh, settled on. Uh, one approach is to just look at the function that is slow. If it's amenable to Numbo, just replace it with a Numbo implementation, however that works. Um, the problem, or feature, depending for you, uh, is Numbo is now a required dependency. So if you just outright replace the implementation, you now have to take Numbo as a dependency. So some, some libraries like UMAP and Libroza and stuff have just taken this approach. Uh, advantage is you don't have to maintain multiple implementations. Um, if you don't want to take Numba as a hard dependency, but as a sort of uh, optional dependency, uh, another approach is to do a little bit to basically say, okay, I'm going to only compile this function when Numba is present. So what you basically do, Numba's in primary interface is a decorator you put on the function. You could make your own version of that decorator that if Numba is detected is basically do nothing, just pass the function through. And if Numba is present, it's the Numba JIT decorator. Uh, that, in that case, Numba is an optional dependency. Now, this sounds appealing, but uh, it is sometimes hard. There's sort of a Venn diagram of like fast stuff with NumPy, fast stuff with Numba, a literal identical implementation that's the, that's fast in both isn't doesn't cover all those cases. So you may find in some circumstances it's hard to write a function that maximizes performance in one versus the other. Uh, common case here is that uh, if um, your goal in using Numba is to you're like you've chained together uh, five different NumPy calls in an incomprehensible way to try and avoid writing a for loop, uh, and the Numba answer is just write the for loop, um, you can't have the same implementation for both with Numba and without Numba. Um, so that's where you get to three, is to actually have a, effectively a uh, mechanism in your library to switch between implementations. That at some level there's a registry or something where you're going to say, okay, based on whatever, I'm gonna switch from my NumPy implementation over to my number one, if I detect number. Numba can still be an optional dependency in this case, and you can tailor each implementation to maximize performance on the system. Now you have two implementations and have to worry about how to test those. Uh, this, however, can be a good strategy when you're dealing with other things that you might not know if the user has. Like if you want to have a NumPy, a Numba, and a GPU implementation, and you don't know that your user has a GPU, uh, you may want this third approach will open up that uh, ability for you in the future. All right. Another thing that's good when, before you get started is become familiar with Numba's limitations. Numba is focused on numerical cases. We don't cover everything in Python. Uh, the reference guide, um, I was in, excited to hear Juan say that our documentation was good because we never think that, but <laughs> you never think your documentation is good. Um, and there are obviously limitations and we, we, you know, I'm not gonna claim it's good. But we have tried to put a lot in there. So I would say spending a little time to look through what we can do and what we can't do will help you uh, frame things right for when you start working. Uh, so when you get into the refactoring, there are a couple of rules I usually keep in mind. One uh, is always, 
a little asterisk, but I'll, I'm going to make the bold statement. Always use no Python equals true. What this means is that if uh, if you use the, the JIT decorator by itself, and this is something we've actually been struggling with in the most few releases, is how to uh, help people avoid this pitfall. Numba will first try to compile your function basically saying, OK, if I can get all the types exactly right, I can, I, I can translate this to machine code that will basically run as fast as Fortran. Uh, if I can't, there's another mode the compiler will fall back into in which it's basically translating the interpreter loop. Uh, and in that situation, except in some cases, uh, it's going to not produce code that's really that much faster than what you already have. So uh, rather than say, oh, well, JIT always works, I would rather that you get the error message that says, ah, we couldn't actually figure out the data types in here. And because oftentimes there's just a small tweak or something that you could do that would fix the problem. For example, uh, you might say, oh, that's okay. I know when it's gonna, when number's gonna work and not gonna work. And, and if I show you this function right here and you look at this and you think, uh, you know, is this gonna compile in no Python mode? Uh, and, and you, you know, this actually won't. Um, but the trick question here is, uh, you can't tell, because I didn't tell you what the types were of y, t, theta, and x, theta. So <clears throat> if you have no Python mode equals true, when you try to actually compile this, you will get the error that says, uh, can't unbox heterogeneous list float 64 not equal to in 64. Somewhere in here, in fact, if you look closely up there, you have a list that has a mixture of floats and ints. And so number being super pedantic, Sue likes to call it a performance linter in that it will just annoy you until you write performant code, um, for which I'm, I'm sorry, I wish we could be more magical. Uh, has, has pointed out to you, hey, your, your list isn't all the same data type. Now we're going to have to, like, you know, in principle, if number were to accept this, it would have to do some kind of dynamic type switching or convert that into a float on your behalf, which maybe is okay, maybe it's not. In this case, it would be okay. Um, so by turning on no Python equals true, you get a chance to figure out what the problem is. Uh, another note is, however, if, you know, we have given you an escape hatch, um, that if you go look in the docs for something called an object mode block, um, actually I wish I'd put a code example in here, I think I left it out on accident. Uh, there's a way in number when you're in no Python mode to explicitly jump back out into interpreter land to do something that we can't compile. Um, this tends to be good for things like IO, callbacks, progress bars, um, and if these are things that are not really the bottleneck in the function, you should use the interpreter. Don't, don't force everything to compile. Compiling is not the goal, speed is the goal. Um, it's still, I think, better for future uh, for future things to be able to reorganize your code um, to be not need the object mode block, but if it's there, if you need it. Second thing to note is pay attention to data types. Uh, obviously, if you want to use Numba, please put your data in NumPy arrays if you can. Um, these are the data types that Numba is going to work the best with. We can unbox them quickly. We can work with them. Things that also work are things like tuples, strings, enums, um, simple scalar types, ints, floats, booleans are obviously no problem. Um, Globals are fine for integer constants. Numba will try to freeze them at compile time. Uh, try to pass the rest of your data as arguments. Just This is also not bad um, for uh, just general programming practice to not have a bunch of globals. Uh, things that are not so good are objects, lists, Python lists, dictionaries, that sort of thing. Um, so actually, we'll skip down here. One thing I want to call out is we've been introducing new typed containers for things that don't really fit into an umpire array well. So for example, we have a type dictionary that you can create a dictionary where you tell us the key and value types. You can manipulate it in Python, but when you pass it into Numba, we can uh, unbox it super quickly and it will be uh, very fast, uh, almost disturbingly fast. Um, uh, the list, we just announced release candidate for 0.45. We'll have a type list in there. This is ultimately where we're trying to go with dictionary list is these type containers. Um, and the reason that we made these, uh, like why did we make a type list, uh, is that you can make a list that contains other lists that contains integers or that sort of thing. So the sparse people were saying, hey, could we have a list of list of int that's fast? We're going to have that now and it is, it is fast. Um, go ahead and skip that. All right, next rule. Write it like Fortran. I know some people in the room are excited and some of you are angry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you thought we've spent so long trying to get away from what, what anyway. Um, Numba frees you from some of the constraints of Python that have been training you to write code in a particular way that you can break when you need them. It's not saying that it's, it's you know, 1978 again. Uh, but you know, calling small functions is totally cheap and free thanks to inlining. Uh, manual loops will perform as well as array func functions. Array functions are still good, but if a loop would be easier to read and easier to write, just write the loop. 
<clears throat> Another thing to note is that prefer functions over classes. Um, in that typing sense, uh, self is an object. We're not going to know what to do with the self. Uh, this is an example from PyMCMC stat where they had to make a custom uh, numerical function that happens to be methods, but it could have just been standalone functions. I mean, it served their need. But I was able to JIT compile this and make it substantially faster just by getting rid of the self because it wasn't doing anything for you and bumping it out and making them top level functions. Uh, but to note, uh, array expressions and ufunks are also good. So if you write, if you can express what you want as an array expression in your thing, we'll compile that and fuse all the loops together. So you will get the benefits without having to write the for loop yourself. So don't write the for loop if you don't have to. But if you need to, just do it. Um, also, just an interesting thing I noted in that performance linter sense, I was having trouble compiling this one function. And it turns out in this code, uh, they have accidentally used a, a length one array as a scalar. Um, and actually, you can speed this up enormously if you just add in a little index zero on the end of those. I was going to open a PR on their thing, just to note that. All right, final thing, target serial execution first. You've heard a lot about how awesome parallel programming is and all that stuff. Uh, don't get too crazy with that up front. Worry about optimizing the serial performance first, then think about parallelism as while you're doing that work. Threads make everything harder to reason about. Your algorithm might not be in a parallel form yet. Uh, and if the serial version meets your performance goal, just stop. Don't go parallel if you don't have to. But think, if you want to think about parallel, we do give you uh, things that will help you do that. So for example, things like um, automatic parallelization of array expressions that was contributed by Intel. Um, we have a P range, which is like a range, but the loops run in parallel, like OpenMP. Um, however, once you venture into this space, you have to think about race conditions because number won't save you from those. So things like read after write and write after write race conditions are things you will have to think about. This is why I advise people not to go parallel unless they have to. All right, finally, uh, if you're going to be sharing things with other people, um, if you want to have numbers as a dependency, just put it in your requirements file or your condo recipe. We have wheels for 2735 through 37 uh, on Windows, OS X, Linux. Um, Conda packages are available in the same the usual places you would see. Uh, num note that Numba does not require, this often confuses people, we use LLVM, we statically link LLVM. We do not require that people have a compiler on their system if they install the binary package and they don't have to have LLVM installed, which is good because if they have LLVM installed, it's guaranteed to be the wrong LLVM, statistically. <laughs> LLVM is, uh, is a hell of a library. So, <laughs> I'll say. Um, <laughs> so we statically link it just to take all that out. So uh, this is really good for Windows users because they're not going to have Visual Studio hanging around. And so uh, this is um, very helpful. So one of the side effects of this, which we didn't think people would care about, but have com communicated back to us, is that all, if all of your machine code is actually coming via Numba, you might be able to ship a source-only package again uh, and not have to worry about building your wheels of your package for a billion different platforms if all of the high-performance code is coming through Numba compiled functions. Um, that's not an, a benefit we thought about too much. Uh, and I just want to conclude by noting that Numba is far from finished. Um, we have many things left to do. Uh, we're aware of the pain and the things that you feel when you push on the boundaries of, of what Numba is good at. Um, big for us is giving you better tools to know what's going on. Profiling, looking at what the compiler is doing, um, being able to JIT a class is something that has been, you know, is, has limited support. We know you want more. Error messages are the eternal struggle. Um, we don't like the error messages either, but it turns out it's a little hard to reconstruct exactly what to tell you was wrong from the the confetti of bits down at the bottom once we've done all the translation. But we, it's, we will always keep working on that. Uh, and we always want to you know, expand the subset we can make fast. So uh, with that, I will conclude actually with uh, some resource links if you want to learn more. Um, we'll, be, we'll be sprinting on Numba uh, tomorrow. Um, come if you want to contribute to Numba or figure out how to use Numba with your project. We actually love those conversations because you teach us things that we didn't know about what you're trying to do. So thanks, everyone. So we have time for maybe a couple of quick questions. Go back there. Hi, great talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, utilities for writing parallel code. Like, is there a way to specify update should be atomic or um, sort of parallel safe? collections for people to switch over to using? Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. So um, 
we have what I would say are somewhat limited options there. Particularly, um, we don't have we don't expose in the CPU any sort of direct atomic operations, which would definitely help in that case. Um, some of the automatic parallelization can detect things like reduction variables, much like OpenMP does, and will handle those safely. Um, but most of it is uh, in those sections where assuming that the threads don't need to coordinate. So it's a good place to fan out and say update a bunch of elements in an array. Uh, and then come back into the serial section and do whatever stuff you need to do. So really, really sophisticated parallel algorithms uh, are not going to be implementable in number yet. We have time, I think, for one more question. Uh, just a quick question. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I wonder if we are going to be able to um, control the number of threats. Yes. Any day. Uh, so I forget. Sue, so is there an environment variable that controls that? I thought we had that. Okay. If 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 there is a there's a in the docs there's a page that lists a, an absurd number of environment variables that can control stuff. Um, that doesn't answer the question fully because sometimes people want to control threads individually or at runtime. Um, we don't have that hook yet, but that's something we need to add. Let's thank the speaker one more time. Yep.